Well, thank you, Rod, for uh, introducing me and uh, organizing this exciting program. I'm truly honored to be part of this program and uh, happy to share some of my thoughts about um, what's going on in North Korea, particularly in the relationship between North Korea and the U.S. Well, um, of course, um, some of you have come here this morning thanks to the dramatic remarks made by Trump and Kim Jong-un. Uh, President Trump made this uh, statement at the UN General Assembly that the U.S. may not have uh, any other option but to totally destroy North Korea. And uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, responded this morning by saying that uh, he may not have any other option but to respond with the strongest measure ever. And so the war of words uh, has uh, escalated. And uh, that's in a way the gist of uh, my presentation today. Uh, that is uh, the U.S. and North Korea have been engaged in this uh, tit for tat and uh, uh, North Korean and, and uh, uh, North Korean actions and uh, words can be better understood when they are placed in this context of uh, strategic interaction of a tit for tat. And uh, uh, once we understand this uh, tit for tat, it's actually very easy to not only understand North Korea but also even make predictions. As a matter of fact, I made, made a prediction in the first class of this fall term uh, that the North Koreans uh, would fire a missile before the end of the term. And of course, I was proven right. And uh, <laughs> the, my students were supposed to buy me pizza. <laughs> and so I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to my award. <laughs> Um, thanks to a uh, great leader, uh, Kim Jong-il, <laughs> Kim Jong-un. And uh, of course, um, the first part of my presentation, six years of uh, challenges that have been posed by Kim Jong-un since he assumed power uh, after Kim, Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il's death, is a familiar story, uh, a lot of uh, nuclear tests this kind of a threat that, that they will destroy the uh, White House. Kim Jong goes to the front line and tells the soldiers to drive the enemy into fire pit. That's exactly the words he used. You know, they do this kind of military exercises and they even show this map that um, shows the trajectories of the missiles from North Korea somewhere here to various points in the, U in the U.S. Very bombastic threats. And of course, uh, just a few weeks ago, North Korea started uh, doing all sorts of uh, provocations, uh, missiles, uh, hydrogen bomb test, another round of missiles. So um, we are familiar with uh, this part of the, uh, the uh, story. Uh, Kim Jong-un is uh, very aggressive in conducting these uh, weapons tests and uh, saying uh, horrendous things and refusing uh, to engage uh, the world. Um, but um, my argument is that um, we need to situate these um, actions by the North Koreans in the context of uh, American actions for the past 60 years. And uh, this is the part of the, of the strategic interactions that's less well known. And uh, this is uh, what I call the unfamiliar U.S. nuclear crisis. We are much more familiar with the North Korean nuclear crisis, but um, there has been U.S. nuclear crisis over Korea since 1950. And uh, we need to understand this in order to understand uh, North Korea. And uh, the 60 years crisis of uh, uh, American uh, nuclear uh, weapons started in 
November 1950, and has continued until today, when uh, Trump, Trump, Donald <coughs> Trump came out and said um, the U.S. will totally destroy uh, North Korea. Uh, on November 30, 1950, Truman came out and uh, made this uh, statement during the press conference that um, uh, at using atomic bomb was uh, one of the options uh, he was uh, actually uh, considering, and uh, that made a, a big shock. Um, this was only five years after the U.S. dropped two bombs, atomic bombs over Japan. And uh, here, uh, again, uh, President Truman was uh, saying that uh, uh, he might use uh, nuclear weapons again. And so it was uh, so shocking, uh, the British pre Prime Minister uh, took a flight the following day uh, uh, to have a meeting with uh, President Truman to bring him to senses <laughs> and uh, not to use uh, atomic bombs. Maybe he was successful. Um, uh, uh, and uh, even though uh, Truman uh, did uh, release, uh, uh, did sign an authorization uh, to uh, release atomic uh, warheads to the military, uh, the weapons were not used at the time. But even after the war was over, even after the armistice was signed, the U.S. Uh, continued to uh, develop uh, plans to use um, uh, atomic bombs over Korea. And so, if you look at this document that was uh, signed on August 20, 1953, just uh, two weeks after the armistice agreement was signed, um, the strategic command had an outline plan uh, to use um, atomic bombs against China, Manchuria, and North Korea. And then um, this plan was uh, further developed into a uh, bomb uh, target list. And so this is um, uh, one of the lists list that uh, were produced in, in 1956. And uh, it has uh, many targets in so the Soviet, then Soviet Union, China, and North Korea. And uh, I was able to translate these uh, coordinates into a location in a map, thanks to Google Earth. <laughs> and that, that number uh, translates into uh, Supung. This is uh, Supung Dam, so, you know, one of the largest, well, the largest, uh, largest dam in North Korea, between North Korea and China. And the bomb was uh, supposed to be dropped right here. And then, there are uh, more than 50 uh, targets in this list. This is um, just another one, Shinuiju. Uh, Shinuiju, uh, one of the largest cities bordering China. And uh, the bomb was uh, supposed to be dropped right in the middle of uh, Shinuiju Xi. And then, of course, uh, Pyongyang was not left out of this list. And, uh, uh, the bomb, a bomb or bombs were supposed to be dropped right in front of this um, Chuche Towers. S some of you might have seen this. And so this was the in intended target. And so uh, the U.S. Um, had these um, uh, uh, targets on, on their list. And uh, if uh, bombs were uh, dropped, something like that uh, would have happened. There are different estimates of uh, fatalities and casualties. This one happens to be over uh, 100,000. And uh, I don't know if uh, people in the South realize this, but um, if the wind blows in an unfortunate direction, South Korea would not be immune from the fallouts. So even if uh, a bomb is uh, dropped in Pyongyang, uh, South Korea could suffer from uh, the fallouts. But anyhow, uh, that was uh, one of the plans uh, that the military had, and uh, in 1968, um, the uh, uh, Joint Chief of Staff uh, developed a different kind of plan, and uh, part of the plan, um, in response to 
uh, North Koreans' uh, capture of uh, American uh, spy ship Pueblo was um, codenamed Freedom Drop. And uh, I guess uh, American military uh, associate freedom with um, atomic bombs. <laughs> and this plan was uh, to uh, drop uh, several atomic bombs um, against North Korea. And so I can go on and on about uh, the plans, but um, I, I move forward to uh, the Bush administration. This is uh, a baby Bush, George W. Bush administration, who adopted uh, the strategy of uh, unilateralism and uh, a preemptive strike. And uh, the goal of uh, uh, unilateralism and the preemption was um, a regime change and uh, uh, occupation. And of course, uh, this uh, strategy was applied to Iraq, and uh, we are still seeing consequences of uh, uh, this um, uh, action. And of course, um, uh, Iraq was not the only target, as we know. Uh, George W. Bush listed Iraq, Iran, and North Korea on the axis of evil, and uh, North Korea uh, could be uh, a target of uh, this strategy also. And uh, there are many indications that uh, North Koreans um, actually accelerated uh, their nuclear weapons program in response uh, to this. And uh, we see that um, uh, the first uh, nuclear test was uh, conducted after this, and then uh, many others were conducted under the Obama administration. And uh, you might ask why Obama is a good guy if Bush is not such a good guy. Well, when it comes to Korea, particularly nuclear uh, strategy, Obama was not so different from George W. Bush. It may surprise you. Um, Obama did the reverse unilateralism. Obama did you know, reverse uh, preemptive strike doctrine. But um, he chose uh, to remove North Korea from negative security assurance. He chose to deny the North Koreans from a guarantee that uh, they would not be attacked with an American nuclear weapons first. And then uh, he further uh, refined and developed American nuclear strategies targeting uh, North Koreans. And, and so if the, if the U.S. had a large deterrence strategy, uh, Obama came up with a tailored a deterrent strategy that was really uh, targeted at, uh, at North Korea. And uh, uh, North Koreans have responded to this by uh, conducting a few more uh, nuclear tests. And Trump uh, created a uproar with his, this remark about fire and furry. And, and then uh, he even raised the uh, stakes higher by saying that, that he has uh, uh, no choice but to totally destroy uh, North Korea. And so the, uh, the larger point that I'm making this part of the presentation is that um, uh, the Korean Peninsula has had uh, this uh, nuclear crisis over, for over 60 years. And uh, North Korean uh, nuclear missile programs and uh, their uh, strategic behavior in general can be better understood when they are seen in this uh, strategic context. And uh, since um, the 1990s, uh, North Koreans uh, have uh, responded to uh, Americans uh, American actions uh, in terms of a tit-for-tat tactic. So if uh, Americans uh, take an action, uh, North Koreans uh, would respond in kind. And uh, that's exactly what has been happening. And uh, it only accelerated under uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, Kim Jong-un's rule, but um, the nature of a tit-for-tat has not changed uh, a single bit. And uh, just uh, to il illustrate the tit-for-tat, I could just uh, quickly go through uh, some pictures 
that show what happened in 2013. And uh, here you see some of the photos that I showed at the outset as a part of uh, my argument about Kim Jong-un's aggressive behavior. But uh, Kim Jong-un's aggressive actions should be seen in this context. So um, a joint military exercise between the South, between the US and South Korea began on March 1st. And then this came. And then there was a joint military exercise again. And then this came. A bomber or two bombers from Guam. And then this. Stealth bomber from uh, the US continent. And then this one. And uh, what we just saw in August and September of this year shows the exact same pattern. So um, late August saw the beginning of a military exercise. And this was North Korean response. Uh, this was a US and this was a North Korean response. UN sanctions. And this was a North Korean response. <laughs> <laughs> I had fun with the PowerPoint. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, the latest uh, American response. And uh, uh, I'm actually holding my breath um, because um, I am afraid that uh, North Koreans would uh, respond in kind again. Uh, what Kim Jong-un said this morning is uh, respond, response in kind. You know, Donald Trump said something, and so uh, North Korean leader said something in return. Uh, but um, North Koreans have not responded to this action in kind yet, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if they do soon. Having said that, having said that uh, North Koreans uh, have been responding to American actions in kind, I would like to end with a more optimistic note by showing that uh, North Koreans um, uh, have responded to engagement, with engagement. And uh, that's an important part of a tit for tat that we should not forget although it is largely forgotten. Uh, there were agreements, and uh, these agreements succeeded first in freezing North Korean nuclear programs, and so uh, the nuclear reactor and reprocessing facilities were frozen, and the inspectors uh, put seals on the doors, and put you know, monitoring cameras, and uh, ensured that, that there were no activities while the Geneva Agreed Framework was in place. And then later, when the Six Party with talks were going on, uh, North Koreans uh, disabled. This was a step further than freezing. So North Koreans, for example, took out some pipes from its uh, nuclear uh, reactors. Uh, North Koreans uh, took out um, some uh, pieces from a glove compartment of a reprocessing facility. So it's not just a freezing, but it's actually taking out some pieces and parts from uh, the facilities. And uh, uh, North Koreans even uh, destroyed a cooling tower. So uh, these are important measures that really disabled uh, the uh, nuclear facilities uh, in this period. And so if you look at the 20 years uh, record in total, uh, you see a tit for ten. If, uh, there, if there was an engagement, uh, North Korea responded with a freeze. An engagement during the six party talks, disabled. But if uh, there was a military pressure, sanctions, or military actions, then North Koreans responded with um, uh, its own uh, military actions. 
And so um, the record is, um, I think, uh, quite clear. Uh, as a social scientist, uh, one cannot really have a better uh, empirical evidence of a strategic interaction where one responds to another uh, in kind. And so, you know, one would think policymakers and the general public would understand this pattern. I mean, this is a very, very consistent pattern for the past 20 years. So consistent, I was even able to, you know, make a prediction and win pizza. But um, somehow, uh, many policymakers uh, don't seem to see uh, this uh, clear pattern. And uh, I think uh, part of the problem is uh, media. I don't hope there is uh, no media today. <laughs> and uh, uh, the media tends to uh, forget uh, important parts of um, uh, the reality. Uh, that is, for example, uh, Pyongyang uh, made a proposal in July 2016. Uh, last year uh, to uh, denuclearize. Um, Pyongyang wanted to have a, a dialogue about uh, denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. Um, but uh, Washington and Seoul uh, rejected that proposal right out of the hand. And, and then uh, North Koreans began its uh, nuclear activities and uh, missile activities. And uh, uh, these two, North Korean proposal and uh, Washington and Seoul's rejection, are not usually part of a public discourse. And uh, what usually gets included is uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear activities and missile activities. And I think uh, um, that's unfortunate uh, reality of uh, the way uh, the policy discourse is made. And again, earlier this year, in June, of uh, 2017, uh, North Koreans made a proposal for um, a freeze for freeze. And so the proposal was that um, if the U.S. stops a military exercise, then the North Koreans uh, would uh, stop missile and nuclear uh, test. And uh, the North Korean proposal was actually a, an improved one um, uh, improved over the last proposal. The proposal that they made two years ago was that um, if the U.S. stops military exercise, um, the North would uh, stop nuclear test only. But this time, uh, uh, this guy uh, came out, uh, North Korean ambassador to India, uh, came out and uh, uh, sweetened the deal by uh, saying that uh, North Korea would stop both nuclear and missile test in return for American stopping of um, uh, its military exercise. But again, this proposal came and went without much notice. And uh, it came and went because uh, Washington and Seoul uh, rejected this right out of the hand the next day. And then Pyongyang uh, began its uh, nasty, it was like almost Kim Jong throwing um, temper pendulums, but anyhow. And uh, part of the problem is that, um, you know, these kind of uh, proposals are not uh, registered, and uh, reputable newspapers like the New York Times, and the Daily Center, you know, he is, uh, he's been with the New York Times for forever, and uh, he's the, you know, the main guy who writes about uh, American foreign policies and uh, uh, security issues. And this is uh, how he wrote. Uh, so the, you know, North Korea will never put the nuclear deterrent for self-defense on the negotiating table and flinch even an inch from the road of uh, uh, bolstering the state uh, nuclear force, unquote. So this part is a quotation of a North Korean statement made by uh, the foreign minister. And uh, David Samer put a period right here. But the whole sentence did not end there. The whole sentence had a conditional clause. North Korea will never do this, never put this on the negotiating table unless 
the U.S. removes its hostile policies and nuclear threats. And uh, the partial sentence and the whole sentence are very different. And I think uh, we should pay attention to the whole sentence, not the partial sentence. Uh, and yet, even someone like David Sanger uh, forgets to include this important conditional clause. And I suspect this is uh, what the North Koreans wanted to highlight. But uh, this part, unfortunately, uh, gets left out. And, uh, well, I talked about tit for tat in terms of um, uh, actions and, and words, and uh, I didn't uh, put these uh, somewhat, you know, somewhat the theoretical uh, way, and, and, and I'm not going to do that, but um, let me just say that, um, uh, you know, your international relations scholarship, uh, there is a, a well-established uh, body of uh, literature that the tit for tat is the best tactic for cooperation. And so Robert Axel wrote, for example, wrote this influential book um, that uses a computer, computer simulation to show that the tit for tat is uh, really uh, the best um, way to produce uh, international cooperation. But here, in the relationship between the, the US and North Korea, tit for tat did not produce cooperation, but rather has exacerbated uh, the situation. And so one asks why. And uh, my answer is that um, many scholars like uh, Axel Roth um, forgot to include social dimension of uh, international relations. And uh, um, uh, US and North Korea are engaged in a social relationship that is uh, characterized by social enmity. They are in a state of a war. And uh, their tit for tat exacerbates <coughs> social enmity. The condition of uh, enmity gets uh, consolidated and strengthened by their tits and, and uh, tats. And uh, as a result, uh, the situation gets uh, uh, even more tense and more dangerous. And uh, I have this whole model of how this um, works, and that this model works really well to explain nuclear test in 2009, uh, 2013, and so forth. But this is mainly for those who are more theoretically inclined. But uh, if you are concerned about the situation, and if you are uh, concerned about um, uh, the news, I think uh, uh, the moral of my, lecture, my presentation today is that uh, you need to put North Korea in the context of um, its strategic action interactions with the U.S. And, and once you do that, you too can make predictions about North Korea. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, our next, next speaker, um, Andrew Jackson from Monash, is senior lecturer and convener of Korean studies. Uh, he's a historian by training and has developed a keen interest also in popular culture and North Korea. He's the author of the 1728 Mushin Rebellion, Politics and Plotting in 18th Century Korea, and he's co-editor of Korean Screen Cultures, Interrogating Cinema, TV, Music, and Online Games. Please, uh, I think you've already welcomed him, perhaps, but if you haven't, please join me in welcoming him. Um, thank you very much, Roald, and uh, ANU for inviting me here today from Melbourne. It's a lot warmer here than it was in Melbourne, a lot less rainy as well. Um, uh, I, I'd like to say, start off by saying, Professor Saar, I've got a bone to pick with you. I thought you were going to talk about the imminent collapse of North Korea when you talked in your title. It's a bit misleading, uh, but you didn't. Um, so I'm going to have to fill that in. Uh, <laughs> Uh, over the years, there's almost a virtual industry uh, grown up in the prediction of the imminent collapse of North Korea. Uh, I remember it from when I was at university in the 1990s. You know, Eastern Europe's gone, North Korea's next. I remember it after 1994 when Kim Il-sung died. I remember it after the famine. I remember it after 2011. 
North Korea is just about to go. And uh, we're still getting these predictions right now. It hasn't gone, and remarkable as it may seem, it's still there. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is one of the scenarios for uh, potential collapse of uh, North Korea, and that is by a popular uprising, or what you might call a revolution. And I'll, I'll talk about a lot of theory of revolution, and they always ref talk about revolution. I prefer mass rebellion, but um, uh, we can talk about that after if you're interested in the theory. Um, but the image we should have in mind is of a, um, uh, something like the events of 1989 in East Germany or Romania, uh, or maybe in Libya uh, and in uh, uh, Egypt and Tunisia of something like a mass demonstration, explosion of anger, of popular anger, um, uh, elites maybe joining in the demonstration, uh, military refusing to crush the demonstration, and then um, eventually the uh, regime is overthrown. So this is the kind of rebellion we're talking about. And um, um, there are um, there are many several uh, researchers who have uh, predicted this kind of uh, uh, event occurring in North Korea. Now I should say first from the bat I'm 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 kind of uh, a bit uncomfortable giving this talk because I'm not really a scholar of a uh, researcher into North Korea so much as a, a historian of rebellion in Korea. And as a, a historian I like to look at events that have happened, not events that haven't happened and may never happen. Um, and also, a lot of the information I'm going to be using is um, rather specul speculative, uh, especially about the political institution, military institutions in North Korea. Um, there's a lot of conflicting evidence, simply because researchers don't seem to know uh, exactly what's going on. Uh, and another thing I should uh, say, unlike predicting mis missile launches in North Korea, predicting <laughs> Uh, revolutions is incredibly difficult. It's, um, Jack Goldstone calls it the paradox of revolutions. In hindsight, it seems so obvious that something's going to happen in Egypt or in Tunisia, but no one ever predicts these things uh, are about to occur. So what I'm going to talk about then is um, um, this imminent collapse of uh, the DPRK through uh, some kind of uh, explosion of anger. And I think this is quite a timely uh, uh, discussional topic because of the question of economic sanctions. A journalist last week asked me, look, do you think if we, if we tighten the sanctions enough in North Korea, then there will be this explosion of anger? Now, if a journalist is working this out, maybe some of our political uh, colleagues in, in Washington or elsewhere uh, have got the same thought in mind. Um, one researcher who looked at this question in particular is uh, Victor Cha. And you may have heard of him, he's probably about to become the uh, uh, US uh, ambassador to Seoul. And uh, he wrote a book, Impossible State, a few years ago, which was very interesting. And uh, he argued that um, we're likely to see, very shortly, a, um, uh, a Ceausescu moment in North Korea. And North Korea is actually a, a train wrecking motion, it's about to collapse, a ticking time bomb. And Ceausescu, as you remember, is the, is the Romanian dictator, and he, there was a moment when he addressed crowds, a stage-managed crowd event, and the crowds, many of the crowds turned upon him, and this set in, uh, in motion a chain of events that led to his overthrow. And Victor Char says, the evidence for this train wrecking slow motion, this ticking time bomb, are a series of incidents that have occurred all over Korea, North Korea, um, some are clashes, riots, food riots, some are clashes with security services uh, between people and uh, the military, some are coups, attempted military coups, some are just simply uh, uh, illegal posters or examples of uh, seditious graffiti. All sorts of events are thrown in here by Cha, but I would argue it is a very significant list of events. And he's really um, tried to get all this information together. But he says this is evidence of this uh, ticking time bomb, that this, uh, this anger is about to uh, explode. Uh, he argues that what's led to this state of affairs is actually the 1990s economic failure, the, the collapse of the public distribution system, um, the famine, and uh, also... Uh, this combined with 
increasing amounts of uh, marketization from below, so people engaging in trade, ordinary people in North Korea, engaging in trade, crossing the border into China, picking up uh, goods, bringing them back, selling them, uh, engaging in sort of market activities. Uh, in addition to this, there's a, a certain amount of heterodox ideology, so information about the reality of life in South Korea that actually is quite uh, prosperous and it's not the the, the, the horrible place that uh, the leadership claims it is. So this, this leads to this kind of uh, ideo ideological gap and this gap uh, between what the regime, the official discourses of the regime, uh, and what, the, uh, what people see is actually going on uh, through, this, um, through these DVDs or smuggled uh, information about North, uh, South Korea. So this is gap occurring and um, this will lead to this explosion of anger. Uh, he also argues that some, some act, uh, catalyst, for example, uh, a crackdown on markets, which is uh, what occurred in 2009, and there was a spike in these events around that period, this would be the uh, catalyst for this revolution, he argues. Now, in theoretical terms, what he's arguing is, is quite sound. If you look at uh, research on rebellion, um, he identifies a transient cause of rebellion, which is quite frequent uh, um, Occurrence. He also identifies a, a, a society un, in unstable equilibrium, which is a society ripe for uh, uh, rebellion, uh, using Chalmers Johnson's expression. Now, there are some problems with his um, uh, assumptions, and this is what I'm going to look at today, really. First, is, the North, Korea, is North Korea in a state of unstable equilibrium? And here's a very interesting picture. This is taken maybe last week uh, in North Korea. And you can see these are, this is a rural sort of community. And you can see these uh, sort of farmers' plots, which are overflowing with um, uh, uh, sort of vegetables and things to be produced. Why? Well, these are going to be taken to market and sold as surplus to make a bit of uh, extra money for p local people. So this is a very interesting sort of manifestation of this marketization from below that a lot of researchers are, are talking about in, in, the, in North Korea. But if we talk about this marketization from below and people engaging in this kind of market activities, are we actually witnessing a uh, society in this unstable equilibrium? Or are we seeing something quite a lot more stable? Che Yong Sob uh, has written a very interesting uh, article where he looks at exactly the same data as Victor Cha. He looks at the influx of heterodox information coming in from through smuggled DVDs, through information about the reality of life in, in the Republic of Korea. Uh, and he also looks at the marketization from below that Victor Cha also looks at. But he says that actually this has led to complete opposite of what Victor Cha is saying. He's saying, look, um, the uh, regime in Pyongyang is actually able to rule um, with uh, using Gramsci's idea, uh, maintaining a system of domination without hegemony. In other words, people will go along, they'll, they'll toe the line, they'll go along with, um, with what uh, Pyongyang is saying, as long as they don't attempt any too many structural changes, i.e. they don't interfere with market activities. They don't try to clamp down the markets like they did in 2009. Now, this is a very sort of persuasive argument, so that's one pro question we can ask about Victor Char's uh, argument. Is it actually uh, a society in unstable equilibrium? Another problem with his, um, with his argument is he actually identifies a kind of revolution that we would call central collapse, and this is what happened in in uh, Egypt, in Tunisia, uh, in East Germany, in Romania, where uh, demonstrations broke out in the capital city, uh, also like uh, Professor Kim talked about this morning, but instead of it going to uh, being dealt with problems, political problems being dealt through constitutional means, um, it, it escalates, the crisis escalates, um, and um, maybe the military joins with the demonstrators and being in the centre of power, being close to uh, political institutions, um, the gov government's much more vulnerable to um, any kind of um, um, sort of mass uh, demonstrations. Um, this is what we saw in these countries, but if you look at the evidence of what Victor Char uh, finds, these, these uh, 
uh, violent incidents, these seditious posters and all this. None of them happen, actually very few of them happen in the capital at all. Most of them are happening uh, in different parts of the countries, far away from uh, the capital. Chongjin, Shinuju that we mentioned before, Hanghum, Onsong. So these are happening at the far extremities of the country, these large-scale clashes. Um, and actually what Victor Chai is, by pointing this out, what Victor Chai is, 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 is actually identify, or he fails to identify an important feature of revolutions that we know as researchers about revolutions, they tend to happen in the same places again and again. And uh, um, researchers looking at uh, pre-modern and modern China have found, and Japan have found uh, consistent patterns of rebellious activity. They tend to occur in certain areas over and over again. Almost, and very often, impervious to any kind of political change. So in China, we saw um, um, sort of changes in government from a feudal, fe more feudal system to a capitalist system to communism, and yet rebellions would occur in the same, same locations over and over again. Uh, why is this? Uh, well, certain areas tend to uh, sort of develop cultures of contention. That doesn't mean people are more rebellious than in other, other areas, but there is sort of a, a precedent for them. Often certain areas have, uh, are more susceptible to food crisis, food shortages. Um, also logistically, it's more difficult for governments to crush rebellions which are far away. So the pattern of rebellions that actually uh, uh, Victor Charles' data points to is not central collapse, which tends to be quite rapid, generally, but actually what we call peripheral advance revolution. And we saw this kind of uh, revolution in, in various countries around the world, Cuba, in Nicaragua, uh, we see it. Uh, we also saw it in Libya, and we saw a variety of it in Sy Syria. And uh, often this kind of revolution tends to be ra rather more protracted, uh, and also it's far more susceptible to um, external influences, particularly changing sort of international relations situations. And we saw that very clearly in Libya and also in Syria, that um, how external governments intervened into these problems uh, sent the, um, the, uh, affected the outcome of the revolution. So in Libya, British, Italians, uh, and uh, French troops or, or military forces joined with the, um, the rebels against the Gaddafi regime and it fell quite rapidly. In Syria you got a very different outcome. You had superpowers uh, uh, joining um, uh, the government side and also uh, helping the rebels and the, the result is, as you see, a sort of protracted bloody mess and a civil war. So it's very important when we talk about revolutions, how they occur and where they occur, um, to consider these, these different patterns. Ominously for the North Korean case, in one of the statistics that uh, Victor Cha, um, uh, one, of, one of the cases, one of the incidents, is one in 1999 in Onsong County, in the far north of the country, on the Chinese border, and this was an incident involving border crossers, or att uh, people attempting to cross the border, probably to engage, pick up goods, engage in some kind of market activity. And this was crushed by elite, allegedly crushed by elite um, border guard units with the um, approval of the Chinese authorities. In other words, they didn't want this pro these problems, this violence spreading into uh, China. So this is kind of, um, if some kind of event, some kind of um, um, violence occurs on the borders, it's uncertain which way China would intervene, and that's what. Um, so, what Victor Chai is saying is, is kind of um, we've got to be a little bit careful about this assumption of the regime collapsing in the centre. Now, I'm just going to move on because I've only got five minutes left, but I'll get to my uh, main point. And my main point is really about the presence of elites in the revolution or in the rebellion. Now, elite groups either second society, dissident groups, or some kind of intellectual fringe groups, or even members of the government, disenfranchised members, often play a very important role in the outcome of revolutions. Um, and one elite group that plays a particularly important role is the military. And as Trotsky said, 
Uh, there's no doubt in the fate of every revolution is decided by um, the disposition of the army. So national crisis will impact members of the army, but the going over of the army to the revolution doesn't happen of its own, of its own accord or through mere agitation. So can we ask the question, what variables will influence the going over of the military to uh, a potential revolution or rebellion? And can we speculate about whether these conditions are in place in the DPRK? Well, um, to do this, I'm going to use some ideas by Terence Lee. He's a researcher in Singapore, and he looked at the outcome of different rebellions, mass rebellions that I've been describing, um, in different Asian countries. And he looked at uh, cases where the uh, military defected and joined the, rev the, the rebels, and uh, the regime was overthrown, for example, in... Uh, the Philippines in 1986 and also in uh, Indonesia in 1998 and he also looked at uh, cases where the military defended the regime and crushed the demonstrations and he looked at uh, Tiananmen Square in 1989 and also Burma in 2007 and this gives, a, gives us a very interesting picture of how to assess this problem and what he argued was very convincingly that a lot of this was dependent upon the a degree of personalism in the military. In other words, if it was very top-down, if the um, dictator was um, dictating a lot of the promotions and uh, um, the, making the key decisions, military decisions, uh, within the military hierarchy, uh, and uh, this overrode uh, the, the sort of general patterns of mili military hierarchy, if he created a sort of parallel military structure to not absolutely not trusting his own military, but created a sort of elite corpse on top of his own military to protect uh, his own rule. Um, this would lead to uh, sort of low morale in, in a split m uh, military. And then on the other, other hand, in cases where um, the military tended to stay loyal to um, the regime, tended to be where there was more power sharing within military institutions, um, sort of institutions that mitigated this uh, level of personalism. So wh what can we see in North Korea? Well, I've got to admit, I've looked at a lot of... Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a funny picture. Uh, I take it you're not laughing at the dogs, but the medals there. Uh, what can we see in, in um, North Korea? And this is where you know, it gets a little bit difficult um, telling what, you know, how these institutions work. There is a lot of information, but it tends to be very conflicting, and that's a problem with um, the information we have about, uh, or I can find about the, uh, the institution in North Korea. But um, Ken Gores, who's an American uh, military scientist, I say, uh, has looked at um, the state of the military, and he argues that actually, you know, in many ways, a lot of the... Um, uh, uh, it's a very personalised system. There's also a, a crumbling sort of economy, uh, keeping, uh, retaining the loyalty of uh, elite military units and officers. Uh, plus there's also this separate military structure within the military there to protect the regime in case of problems. And there's also high evidence of low morale amongst conventional forces, uh, which is generally conscripted. Now we've got all this information, but on the other hand, um, uh, a lot of evidence actually points to the opposite, that actually under Kim Jong-un, you've got a far more uh, uh, sort of level of power sharing amongst military units, and that's quite problematic because it, it means that uh, um, um, the, this prediction of uh, military collapse is, is, it probably wouldn't happen. Also, you've got the, uh, uh, a very large number of special forces, uh, many of which are around the capital, I've seen some of them with my own eyes, uh, protecting elite groups within the capital. And the, 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 the actions of groups like this would be very difficult to predict in the event of some kind of crisis, any emergency. Anyway, I've got to finish, so just to, um, to um, um, sort of sum up, uh, I don't think you can assume any kind of link between popular anger and uh, a rebellion occurring, a popular uprising occurring in North Korea. You certainly shouldn't link that to economic sanctions and 
uh, policy. I think it would be very risky to try and link economic sanctions to some kind of longer term strategy of starving a population into uh, rising up against um, the regime. It's not as simple as that. Regional factors have to be considered, like I mentioned, the, the different patterns of revolution that we've seen, but also what the military would do in the, in the event of a crisis also has to be considered, and that is, I would argue, very unpredictable in North Korea. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm sure there are many questions, so I would like yeah, the, to invite the audience to um, ask questions. Yes. Thank you uh, for the uh, two papers. Uh, I have just two uh, questions for each one. Uh, one, uh, one for each one. Uh, Professor Jason. I was very wondering, you mentioned about the um, 60 years of nuclear crisis, but uh, as you come to the very recent times, uh, around 2016, uh, July 2016, and then uh, June uh, 2017, the Washington and Seoul refused uh, North Korea's uh, proposal. Uh, but at the time, 2016 and 2017, I wonder why they refused because uh, South Korea in uh, 2016 is uh, Park uh, government period, and the Moon Jae-in is more liberal to North Korea, but Park is, I know, it's a very anti North Koreans. That's one question for Professor Jason. And then for uh, the, uh, Andrew, uh, uh, I was thinking about, you talking about rebellions, especially on the north side of the Korea on Honsam. You mentioned that one person, uh, one area with the elite groups, uh, but you were talking about in relation to the China, but Hongsan is more also close to Russia. Is there any connection with Russia as well as China? Thank you. Well, thank you for the, the very good question. Uh, well, um, 2016 had uh, uh, president Obama as American president and uh, Park Geun-hye as a South Korean president. And uh, uh, both of, of them were taking a more conservative North Korean policy orientation. And so, um, you know, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see why they uh, would have uh, 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 turned down uh, the proposal from the North. And uh, 2017 is a more uh, complicated one because uh, South Korea now has a more liberal president. Um, interestingly, the, the rationale um, was uh, the same. So 2016, uh, Park geun and the uh, Obama government turned down the proposal uh, because um, uh, they saw North Korean proposal as a trade of uh, illegal action for 